So the Nubias Academy started in April last year with the first lockdown. Uh, we started a series of webinars about bioimage analysis. Today we have uh, 24 webinars online on the Nubas um, YouTube channel uh, with uh, around 30,000 uh, registration and more than 40,000 views on YouTube. We are really happy to uh, see that uh, this uh, series of webinars is successful and happy to have you here today to listen to this webinar. So this webinar is the third of a series of uh, five webinars on big data. Uh, we had two weeks ago uh, the visualization of uh, big data. And uh, last week we were talking about uh, registration and stitching. And this week, uh, we are talking about how to analyze uh, quantitatively uh, this big data. And um, about this webinar, we have today three speakers. So Matthias Ott uh, is going to talk about LabKit. Uh, he is from MPI CVG in Dresden, so in Germany. Anna Kreschuk is going to talk about Elastic. And she is from Embel at Heidelberg, also in Germany. And Joy Tinove is going to talk about Mastodon and is at the Institut Pasteur in Paris. So with these three speakers, we have a few panelists uh, with us that will help moderate uh, the questions and um, uh, keep the time uh, with the speakers. So I will uh, let Matthias uh, start. Um, Matthias, could you share your screen? I will stop sharing mine. Yes. So hello, I'm Matthias. Um, I will share my screen. Okay, share. So now it should be visible. Yes, yes it's uh, looking good, Matthias. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Marion, for the introduction. I'm Matthias. I work in Dresden at the Max Planck Institute there. Um, and I want to introduce you to a Fiji plugin, which is called LabKit. Uh, LabKit can be used to segment big image data. Um, I developed it over the past years with the help of many of my colleagues. So I want to thank you, Deborah, Toby, Tom, Gabriella, Robert, and Florian for your contributions there. Um, LabKit is a Fiji plugin which does pixel classification. Um, pixel classification is one algorithm that allows to segment an image. Um, many, uh, or I think many of you listening might know pixel classification from other tools like Elastic and Trendbill Vector Segmentation. Um, and the advantage of LabKit here is maybe that it's part of the uh, Fiji uh, environment and also of the Big Data Viewer framework that allows it to work very nicely with really big image data. So what is pixel classification? Um, we try to find out for um, each pixel in an image to which uh, class the pixel belongs. So these classes might be, for example, just be uh, foreground and background. And now you can use LabKit to figure out which pixels of your image are foreground and background. Um, this segmentation is usually the, usually the first step you do when you do an image analysis pipeline. It makes it much easier for the downstream processing to analyze the data, so to maybe count the objects in your image or measure the size of objects. So let's have a look what the looks like in real life. So here I have um, my Fiji running. I open an image and then from the menu, I select LabKit. Here we see the LabKit window with the image open. I mark some of the uh, pixels as background. I mark so some others as foreground and then I run the pixel classification algorithm which all automatically uh, uh, figures out for all the pixels in the image 
if they belong to foreground and background. And now if I'm happy with the results, I can save them to a TIFF file or um, further process them in Fiji. So here we see uh, the result, uh, a binary image that can now be easily uh, analyzed in Fiji uh, by, for example, counting cells or measuring their size. Okay. That was the basic int introduction to LabKit. And uh, now I want to talk a bit about how we actually managed to segment big images. And afterwards, I want to show you two new features in uh, LabKit, which is the GPU support and the cluster support. So how do we manage to segment big images? Um, there goes a big thank you to Tobias Peach, who developed Big Data Viewer and uh, a lot of libraries that are associated with it. And LabKit is built on top of Big Data Viewer, um, which allows me to easily uh, uh, show this big image data. And I also use in LabKit the BDV image file format to store the big image data. So after this, um, basic things are solved, the visualiz visualization and storing the data. First actual problem that LabKit needs to solve is the segmentation of the image data. And here really the data size becomes the problem, is the problem. So some of the images that you might want to process with LabKit might be bigger than the uh, main memory of your computer. And that's the problem because before any data can be processed with the computer, it needs to be loaded into the main memory. Uh, if the image is too big, you cannot load it into the main, main memory. The solution here is easy. We uh, divide the image into smaller blocks, and then these small blocks can easily be loaded into the main memory, and, and we can easily process these blocks in the image. There comes a challenge with this strategy. Um, usually, if you uh, segment these blocks one by one, the results get uh, worse close to the border of these blocks. So a lot of care, we take a lot of care to do that correctly and uh, to really segment every part of the image uh, with equal quality, no matter if they are on the edge of a block or not. Okay. This dividing images into blocks also give us a big advantage. And that is that we can quickly preview the segmentation uh, to the user. So segmenting in a big image might take a few minutes and uh, it would be a bit annoying if you as a user uh, change some settings, uh, segment your image, then you have to wait for a few minutes until you see the first results. So by dividing our image into blocks, uh, we can uh, show individual blocks to the user. And usually if a user looks at big image data, big image data, the user only uh, looks at small portion of the data and only a few of the blocks need to be segmented to be visualized to the user. Okay. Um, there's, there are again a lot of technical challenges in the background associated with it, this, but um, these challenges again have been solved by Tobias Peach and a library called Inclip2 caches, which I use. Um, now I want to talk about the two new features in LabKit, which are GPU support and cluster support. So GPU support. Um, a GPU is uh, another name for a graphics card. Um, 
new computers all, almost always have a powerful graphics card and um, LabKit can calculate the segmentation of an image on the graphics card and that's now 20 times faster than if you would do it without graphics card. Um, this feature is still experimental. Uh, it only works currently for NVIDIA graphic cards. And, but you can, sorry, you can already uh, try it out, out by yourself. Um, if you install these update sites listed here, so the CLIJ and CLIJ2 update site and the LabKit preview update site. So CLIJ, by the way, is a library which allows us in PG to uh, use the graphics card for image processing. And Robert Harse is the person who uh, made this library and big thanks to him for this. So now I want to show you this in practice again. Um, for this, I use the image which I downloaded from the cell tracking challenge. And then I converted it to the big data view file format by using Big Stitcher that you have maybe seen last week in the webinar. So let's start the video. By the way, I'm using a normal Fiji with the update sites CLIJ, CLIJ2, and AppKit Preview activated. So here I have Fiji running. I uh, start LabKit from the menu, open my big data viewer XML file. And here you see uh, the image already. First thing I have to do is to uh, click auto contrast to fix the contrast of the image. And then I can already uh, nicely scroll through the image. By the way, the size of this image is uh, four gigabytes. So uh, Big Data Viewer does a lot to, uh, to view the image so nicely and quickly. So now in the image, I, I scroll to an interesting part and I mark some pixels as background and I mark a nuclei as foreground. Next thing I do is I go to the pixel classification algorithm to the settings and I activate the GPU support. I do some other minor settings and then I train the classifier. So, and after a few seconds already, you see a preview of the segmented image and can have a look at it. So I'm happy with the, this. Uh, so I can now save this result as HDF5 file or here I choose to show the result in the normal Fiji image viewer. Um, now to show the result in Fiji, um, it, the entire image needs to be segmented, which roughly takes eight minutes here. Um, I don't want to wait for so long, so we cancel this. And what I do now is I save the uh, classifier uh, that, that is used to segment the image into a file. So And I do this to be used later. Oh. Okay, maybe a few words about the classifier. So in LabKit, we train a random forest to segment the image. And once the random forest is trained, uh, you can use it to segment many other similar images. And to do so, you need to save the classifier. That's what I do here. Okay. So that was this presentation of uh, the LabKit on big images. You saw that we already quickly 
uh, segmented the images um, or quickly got a preview. Segmenting the image takes another eight minutes for this four gigabyte image size. So <clears throat> that's maybe okay to wait for eight minutes minutes to get your uh, segmentation. If your image data is even bigger, you might consider using an HPC cluster to uh, calculate your image segmentation. And LabKit also supports this uh, for uh, segmenting an image on a HPC cluster. There's a LabKit command line tool. Uh, a command line is what you usually use to uh, interact with cluster hardware. So I also have a video to show you this. Um, which is pre-recorded, of course. So here you see uh, my uh, computer connected to a cluster. Uh, the window on the left side shows um, a folder on the cluster, which already contains my image data. And the LabKit command line tool is here compressed in a zip file, uh, which I downloaded from the LabKit website. And what I will do now is the classifier, which I saved earlier, I copied that to the cluster. And then I go to the uh, terminal here and run some programs on the cluster. So first thing I do is I unzip this LabKit command line tool. And so now you see the LabKit uh, char file, which is this command line tool and the snake make file. All left to do is in the snake make file, I edit um, the name of the image that I want to segment, which here is dataset XML. And I specify the classifier. So the random force to be used for the image segmentation, which is this flu N3DL classifier. And I specify to use the GPU. So next thing to do is to start SnakeMake. Um, SnakeMake is a tool which will uh, run this LabKit command line on the cluster on here I specify to run it on 10 nodes in parallel. So uh, I specify some further parameters and then it starts. So now you would have to wait until your data is uh, segmented, which takes for this data four minutes on this cluster. Um, I will scroll forward. So now everything is done. Um, and all, and now I will uh, update this folder, you see that there are new files. So there is an output folder which contains the segmentation results. And I will use Big Data Viewer to uh, open these segmentation results uh, quickly so you can see them. Okay. Here you see the segmentation results uh, in Big Data View. Okay. So that was the demonstration of how to use LabKit on a cluster. It's really pretty simple. And it's also described uh, with a complete example on this web page uh, of the LabKit command line tool. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation here. So thank you for your attention. Um, to summarize it up, you saw how to use LabKit with big image data. It's really quite easy. Uh, you saw the GPU support, which makes it super fast. You saw 
how you could segment even bigger images on the cluster. And yes, I think now we have time for questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Matthias, for your talk. It was really great. Uh, we have a lot of questions uh, from the audience. And um, so maybe I can start with some of them. Um, I, I would start with one which is uh, about the size of the image. So you mentioned, mentioned the image you, you, you were using in the first part of the talk was uh, four gigabytes. Um, uh, you, you, you were classifying this with, uh, as a big image. Uh, and the, the question is how w uh, will a lab kit cope with images that are above uh, 500 gigabytes? So you showed afterwards this um, uh, one terabyte uh, image. Um, so I... Okay. So, so it, it, it seems to be coping well, but I would add an, an extra uh, layer of question to that, which is, as a user, um, how far can I go in terms of size of images without having to go for a cluster? So. Um, okay, so um, LabKit scales very well. So you saw me handling a four gigabyte image uh, and that took about uh, two minutes per gigabyte. So it took eight minutes to segment it. If you now uh, have a 500 gigabyte image, it will take a thousand minutes. So I don't know how much that is, maybe half a day, but you could still do this with LabKit on your computer. Okay. So that should work. And um, opening a five gigabyte tool with the interactive LabKit plugin and getting results there quickly or a preview of your results quickly will also work just for uh, then uh, calculating the results. Uh, you will have to wait these, these, this amount of time, which is just necessary to do the calculations. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so, I have two other questions that are related to this uh, resolution of file you have. The first one is, do you take advantage of these uh, pyramidal resolution levels for the segmentation and the annotation? And the second one is, can you define the user, uh, the, the block size? Can the user define this? Um, so, no, I don't take advantage of the uh, multi-resolution pyramid. Um, this is used to to nicely show you the image, but when I do the segmentation, I don't make any advantage of the multi-resolution image. And the second question was if the user can uh, specify a block size and the answer is currently no. Okay. So if it's necessary, necessary for whatever reason, you might ask me to help you with that. And then we can see if it's possible. Okay. Uh, I'm looking for other questions. Uh, yes. So I have questions that are more related to uh, what can LabKit do in terms of, uh, uh, of processing. So do you support object classification after the pixel classification? Um, no, it only does pixel classification. So. Okay. Object classification is not supported. And uh, for the when you're using LabKit, can you also process time lapses, or it's only uh, so? A yes, single image. Yes, it works for time lap lapses. It works for two D images, three D image, multi channel images. So you can process all these different image okay. modalities. You can also take EM images and try to process these. Okay. And can you also just repeat what's the format? Because you said it's based on Big Data Viewer. Does it, does it need to be H5 files? So, um, no. You can open any image that you can open with Fiji with LabKit. Okay. It works. 
and yes, just if you have big image data, it's usually better to save it in the BDV format or as the Maris file would also work. Okay, so if you have TIFF files, it's working with LabKit, but it's better to, if they are yeah. big, to... Yes, if you have TIFF files, that works too, but for this eight gigabyte uh, TIFF file that takes a Fiji a few minutes to open them, so that's a bit annoying. Then. Okay. Thank you. I'm just looking for if there is a few more pressing questions. Um, oh, yes. Uh, so is uh, LabKit scriptable? Can you use image and macros? Um, that's also a new thing. I So you can use image and macro. There's a macro recordable LabKit command to segment images, yes. Okay. And maybe can you comment why you you, you chose this, uh, the random forest classifier and not another type of classifier? Or will you in the future add um, other classifiers? So yes, the random forest we use, of course, because it's fast, so it's fast random forest. Um, but there are also plans to uh, use uh, deep neural networks uh, to provide it in LabKit. Okay, yes. that's great. Um, I think just looking at questions, I think we uh, went through most of it. Yes. Uh, yes. So, so for the other questions that are a bit more specific, we will uh, type the answer in the Q&A. And uh, in any case, all the, all the questions and answer will be posted on the image.se forum. So thank you again, Matthias. This was really, really great. Um, we can move now to Anna. Thank you for having me here. Thank you. Hi. So should I start sharing the screen or is there anything yes. else you should? Okay. Please. <laughs> okay. Let me find the right one. Hi, right, do you see my slides? Yes. Ah, always oh, so good to hear that. Okay. Hi, everyone. Great to see such a strong crowd at the Neubias webinar again. Um, yeah, so Matthias actually did a better introduction to Elastic than I planned here. So I will not take as much time as I was planning before. So I'll just jump through the first slides quickly. So I want to show you how to do the biggish data analysis with Elastic, right? So I'm not talking about like tens of terabytes here, which I believe will be covered in the next webinar. So I'm talking about still, let's say reasonable size, under a hundred gigs, because we are still talking about interactive training on this kind of data. Right, so yeah, first about the team, right? So, you know, Elastic is a fairly old project. A lot of people contributed. Um, yeah, so this is the current team. They're not all working on Elastic full-time, but they're all committed to its success. Um, yeah, many thanks to the funders as well. So historically, uh, Elastic has been started in uh, Fred Humphrey's lab at the University of Heidelberg back in 2011 or even 2010, and then as I was a postdoc in Fred's lab, I kind of took over the leadership of the project. And then when I started my own lab at EMBO in 2018, it also moved here with me. All right, so the aim of Elastic is to uh, make useful machine learning algorithms available to people without computational expertise. And also, you know, what was really important for us is to solve diverse methods with the same approach. All right, so I know many of you are already familiar with Elastic, but I thought, okay, I'll give like a very quick overview anyways. And so this whole idea of solving diverse problems with machine learning methods, I would look like this, all right? So we have all these different workflows like pixel classification, object classification and tracking and uh, out of context or boundary based segmentation. And they all based on the same principle of user giving labels and then Elastic making the predictions and then user correcting labels and Elastic correcting the predictions. All right, so if you look at pixel classification, which is probably our most popular workflow, it does semantic segmentation, so it attaches a class to every pixel. So you start from the raw data, you define your labels. I just like Matthias now showed the LabKit, right? So you give your labels and then it assigns a label to every pixel. Right? You can do the same for objects, right? So you start from two populations of objects, you give a few labels, 
and then it assigns a label to every object in the image, or in the volume, or in a 3D time series. Right, you can do the same for boundary-based segmentation, right? So you predict the boundaries, and then you label the correct or incorrect boundaries in there, and then it can give you the segmentation of the full objects. Right, so other workflows also follow the same idea. I just didn't want to show all of them because I don't have as much time. Right, so if you look at the small data analysis, right, and then if you just load a small image of, I don't know, two megabytes, um, and then, yeah, you give a few labels, and then you press live update. So those of you who use the Elastic, I'm sure, have done it many times. Right, and then you give some more labels, and then it updates itself. Right, so the whole procedure is really going this way. You label, you predict, you look where it's wrong, you label some more where it's still wrong, it predicts again. Right, in the end, you're happy with it, you export the result, do your quantification, and publish. Right, so can we take this kind of, a, and you know, in a small data analysis setting, it's also fairly clear how to do it, right? You could even digest the whole image at the same time, compute all the features, compute all the predictions, and then everything is really fast and really interactive. So can you do it for big data? Well, yes, but what becomes really important in this case is the file format, right? Because I know you had a whole webinar dedicated to that in the beginning, but I think this issue is so important that it really bears repeating. And the reason why it's so important is that, well, if you want to parallelize anything, and if you're processing big data, then and you want to parallelize things. And even if you don't want to parallelize because you only have one CPU, right? at least you want to process things blockwise, because then, because otherwise you would not fit into your RAM. Right? So if you want to parallelize, if you want to process blockwise, you have to cut your volume into blocks. If you want to cut your volume into blocks, you have to have a file format that supports efficient reading of subvolumes. I, and here it's uh, well inelastic up to say medium sized files, we prefer H5. If you do serious big data, say above 100 gigabytes, then you should probably use N5. And um, yeah, you know, remember how I said that, yeah, you cut out these little pieces and then you process them independently. And in H5, this is like naturally there if you enable chunking. I know you now heard about the next generation file format. We're also very much looking to that. We will support it once it's there. Multi-page tips hypothetically also support loading parts, right? but for us, these parts are too big. So if you want to be efficient in interactive training in Elastic, you really have to use H5. So how do you convert data to H5? There are multiple ways to do this. The simplest is Elastic itself actually has a data conversion workflow. If you worked with Elastic before, you will see that there is there are just two applets there. There's input data and then output data. That's it, right? You put in your data and then it exports the H5 with all the right chunking, right axis order, right everything. So that's very easy. If you have a data set which is, let's say, not big, 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 but uh, medium sized, but already too big for smooth interactive labeling, then we also have this option where you can just copy your data set into the project file. It will make it H5 by itself. And as an additional bonus, it will also store everything you do in one place. But of course, you will have a copy. So save to project option. There is also, if you're, so both of these would work if your original data is in a format that Elastic can read. Right? And Elastic can read standard image formats. So if you have something more fancy, or if you want to use virtual stacks or something like this, then you need to go to the Elastic Fidget plugin. And there we have a function called export HD5. Right, so there you can open any image that you can open and then export to HDA5 that Elastic can process. It's even, you can do it in a macro, you can script it. So it's all there, all available. And then finally, you can do it programmatically, which is how we do it all the time. And there is, it's fairly easy. We have a notebook example that does this. Since I also shared the link to my slides, you can also see it here. It's really like, if you program anything, this is really not the difficult part. Okay, is it actually worth it to try to do that? Let me try to show you how that would look then if you're trying to process a biggish data set. Okay, so let me share another screen. Do you now see the elastic screen? Yes, we do. Anything? Yes. Uh, yeah, okay, good. Thank you. Um, yeah, so let's add an image. Right? And that's a cutout that I just, uh, yeah, that we made today, it's a nine gigabyte um, volume. It's uh, in H5 with chunking, so it's about 2,000 cubed. 
And yeah, I just wanted to show you quickly how what you can do with it. And so we can se select features. So, you know, it's all like the normal elastic. So in this part, because we haven't computed anything yet, right? nothing really changes. The only thing that it has done so far is stream the tiles that are displayed here from the volume. But if you were not storing it in H5, but if you had a, for some insane reason, I don't know, you can't do really 3D in PNG, but if you had a gigantic 3D TIFF that would not be multi-page, but just a giant TIFF, right? you would have to load the whole thing now and it would already break and we haven't even started training yet. So if we go to training, this is how you can actually make it smooth for large data. Right, so you maximize one view. Right, you come to an area that you think looks interesting. Like, I don't know, I like it here, for example. So it's not very biologically meaningful what I'm going to label now, but I just wanted to show you the idea. Right, so this is a data set. It's an EM data set of a platinary swarm. Right, and here we could, for example, say, OK, this is muscle. Right, and this is the chromatin in the nucleus. Right, and then we can have another label and you could have more labels. Right, and this for this other label, I just need to zoom in so that I could label more precisely. Right, we could say, okay, this would be the membrane. Right, so like here or like here. Right, and now we can uh, train on this and see what it will come to. And then just like I showed you for the very small data set, it will, yeah, then you keep going. Right, so now you can say, okay, that is actually a little bit more yellow here. Right, so this is the general elastic way of doing things. And it's not that different if you have a big data set or a small data set. And the reason why it works is because all the processing here is lazy, right? So if you now zoom out, right? So notice how I stopped live update. And this is very important because if you keep live update on, then as you scroll out of the previously predicted region, it will just pile more and more jobs and requests for more prediction. Right, so, but if you disable live update, then just looking at the data doesn't take much. Right, so now we can also like scroll around, you know, look at other things, see how it looks in a different region, you know, go to, for example, a completely different slice. Right, so we could go here. Right, and then, yeah, let's find some somewhere where we also have muscle, like here. Right, then we can zoom in, predict what it would look like here. And this is exactly how we recommend people to deal with doing this kind of predictions in larger volumes. Because I, mean, I know everyone here is a big champion of reproducible imaging, but still conditions change a little bit. And if you want to really extract quantitative results out of this, you should verify how well it looks in the different parts of the volume. And that's how we recommend people to do it in Elastic. Right? So you zoom in, do it in the small sub part, then you scroll around, pan around, find another area that you think would work well or would not would work, or you want to check how it works. And then you predict again there. And now you see that we could actually add some more labels. I can say that, uh, well, I, mean, I don't even know. Right, so let's say that the nuclear membrane is also a membrane. Okay, so we add some more labels here. Right, and then we can add some more around there. And this is really like, in terms of how you should be doing machine learning, this is really the way to go. Right, so you should be scrolling around the place and trying to annotate in different areas. And even if you don't need annotation in different areas, then at least validate in different areas, even for a big data set. Okay, so that's how it works. If you now want to go on, there is also this prediction export. So if you now want to actually predict your whole nine gigabyte block, right? So here is the prediction export. And you can yeah, export whatever you want. It will automatically cut it into blocks and then process it on your machine here with as much parallelization as your CPUs will allow. All right, so this is for the block that you currently have loaded. If you want to also load some more, you can just select some raw data here and batch processing. This is also still on your local machine. Let me now go back to my presentation. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I think it's worth it to store data in H5 because you can really interactively and nicely and smoothly train on a big data set, right? So this one was 10 gigs. I was doing it on the laptop. Um, yeah, I mean, you can go more. So what's important for interactive training so that you actually enjoy doing it and don't just sit there and wait for things to happen. You have to remember that the processing is lazy. It only predicts what you're seeing. So if you're seeing too much, it will take a long time to predict, right? So don't run live predict when you're scrolling. 
I don't la run light predict when you are completely zoomed out, right? So if you have a very big 2D image, like I don't know, like the pathology set, 20,000 by 30,000 pixel, you zoom out completely, you press predict, it will start to predict the whole thing because feature computation and prediction always happens at full resolution. Right? Another thing that is important to know is like some people, especially now inspired by the way how neural networks are trained, try to programmatically add dense labels. Don't do that with the random forest, it saturates and then it just chokes on it. So it tries to you know, train more and more and compute more and more features. It doesn't actually lead to better predictions. It's better to scroll around and label the places where it's wrong. Another thing which I forgot to show you, but it's there, you can find it in the docs, it's in the slides, you can yeah, rewatch it if you need to remind yourself about this, is that Elastic can also use prediction masks, which means that if you're only interested in a sub part of the volume, you can load the mask together with your um, data and then it will only compute the predictions in the masked area. So we found this was quite useful when working with large brain images because there people are also often interested in just computing it in one area of the brain Right, or a computing statistics per brain part. And then you can mask out different brain parts and then just do it for that. And this is much faster, especially if you have a lot of almost dark background. Okay, after training, like I just showed you now, you can um, prediction export applet, does it for the data used in training, batch processing for unseen data. This is all still on the machine where you've been training or let's say on a single machine. So how can, what is parallelized when you're running? Because you know we all have multi-CPU machines now. Yeah, so all workflows are parallelized across files. If you have multiple time steps, all workflows process time steps independently. Within the same volume, so pixel classification is an embarrassingly parallel operation. It can, it just chooses the block of such size that it passes in your M. Object classification, you have to select the block size and a halo to avoid the artifacts of cut objects. Uh, all other workflows actually need the complete volume. So if you have like a long time series of not too big volumes, it would still get parallelized nicely. If you have a very big block, very big block, and you want to run, say, multicut on this, then we have to use special code that we cannot do it within Elastic yet. Okay, headless processing, which is what you do if you actually want to run on the cluster, if you just don't fancy starting it from the GUI. It's documented in great detail. It has a thousand different options. Um, I think it's actually fairly intuitive, despite having all those many options. The most important parameter there is called the cutout subregion, which is actually specifying what you're working on. Right? And also there, if you're running on a really big data set, don't forget that you need a sensible output format. Right? The N5 format was developed to enable parallel writing. So if you're dealing with real big data, you have to also remember that writing can become a bottleneck. OK, if you want to run on a cluster, we now have also a way to do that um, as a distributed MPI application. There is a flag called distributed that you can just pass to Elastic Headless. It's very efficient, very fast. You don't have to specify the subregions yourself. It can be combined with Slurm. Uh, it's documented in the headless documentation. Um, unfortunately, because it's MPI based, it requires some understanding of the cluster and this, how it's set up there to configure. It only works with N5 input and output for now because for us, that seemed like um, the most sensible option for the big data. I mean, we will, of course, support the next generation format as soon as that's actually available. We also have a Docker image, which even though we haven't publicized it anywhere, enjoys some popularity. So if you want to use that, we are also happy to support you in this. To summarize, the most important thing when working with big data, if you haven't figured it out by now, I will still hammer it in again, I'll format. It must allow for efficient subregion reading. Right, so the lazy backend of Elastic actually allows you for interactive training on out of data sets for pixel and blockwise object classification. Headless processing can run on servers, clusters, clouds, whatever you want. It's fairly easy to run. It's fairly easy to set up. I, the future plans, we are actually thinking more and more about big data. So if you repeat the webinar series next year, I hope I can show you something completely different. So we are planning to explore Dusk for its, because Dusk has a lot of, um, ways how you can run remote distributed computation on a large variety of the cluster flavors or clouds. So we hope that we can uh, kind of piggyback on it and just use their different backends. And another thing is that, like I said, we always compute everything in full resolution, but we are now also working on integration with pyramid aware viewers because you know the elastic volumina viewer is not pyramid aware, but others that we are now looking at are. 
So we will support pyramids then for viewing, and then it only makes sense to support them for computation. And uh, yeah, so we are now thinking of the most intuitive way of doing it without people getting too frustrated of losing labels at the different ends of the pyramid, but this is all solvable questions. So yeah, we are still actively developing this part of Elastic, like right? all the big data parts, because well, obviously as you work in a biology institute ourselves, we are also confronted with bigger and bigger data all the time. So yeah, that's what I wanted to show. Thank you very much for your attention. The docs are there. You know where to find us on the forum. We are on Twitter. Ask the questions now. Look at the slides later. Ask the questions in all these contact options. We are always happy to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, uh, for, for your talk. It was great. Uh, so nicely compliment, complimentary to, to what uh, Matthias showed. Uh, we, so I'm looking at the questions. Yes, uh, we don't have so much related to elastic. Some are already have already been answered by Dominic, but maybe you could say something about H5 uh, versus N5 format, uh, and more generally about like re maybe re-explaining why uh, this kind of format are adapted when you have uh, large data. Yeah, so H5 is basically one file for everything, right? But inside the file, you can store your data set in little pieces that you can then read one by one, right? And usually the chunking is say, well, say 64 cubed, right? Which is fairly granular. So you can read pretty much an arbitrary chunk out of it. So as, and as I try to explain in the talk, this is really important because if you can't read subparts of your volume, right? It means that you will always end up with all your raw data in REM and this is, you know, this doesn't scale. Okay, so this was H5. And so H5 has kind of provided for all the community needs up to a certain uh, size, right? So H5 has its drawbacks, right? It's not a perfect, perfect file format, but it's anyways, it's the best that we had. And the big data viewer is based on H5 and the Maris data format is based on H5. There is no schema. There is, you know, it's not like it's a single thing. I'm elastic file format, the elastic project is obviously based on H5 as well. So it's, um, yeah, it's not like there is big unity about this, but it's just a very useful and easy to use file format where you dump things in and can read them in parts. Okay, so where H5 breaks is when you have to write a lot. And this is why N5 was developed in Stefan Salting's lab. Um, so I don't know if anyone from his lab is actually following, then they could probably explain it much better than I can. So the problem, the, the big bottleneck there in H5 is parallel writing. And what N5 does instead is it, well, to put it simply, it writes a lot of small files and you know where things are, right? So the chunks that before were all lying in one data set can now be all separate files and there is a master that knows what is where. And uh, this way you can also write to all of them in parallel and obviously you can read from them in parallel as well. So ZAR is very similar and I believe the next generation data format that I'm sure you have heard about in the first webinar is trying to kind of make the best of all possible worlds and actually build something that we could all use and just have one format for big data. How amazing would that be? Okay. So I hope that kind of answers it. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope too. Um, I, I have, I, I have a, a question from my side as a, as a user. Um, when would you go for uh, more than a laptop? Then when would you go more like on a cluster? How much effort does it cost to me as a user? How much documentation is there to uh, make the transition? Um, well, if you need the interactive labeling, right, then you can't really go on the cluster, right? I mean, there you still need a single machine. Okay. So I would always encourage people to go on the machine with the most RAM they can find. And uh, there it's, uh, you know, basically, unless I, there are cases where it doesn't matter, right? So for example, if your big data is a long series of small PNGs, right, you know, happens, you don't care, you can just do it on a laptop. Right? If you have, if you are talking like biggish, then we immediately, yeah, the more RAM you have, the smoother everything will be. So you can see that on a 16 gigabyte laptop, you can already do pixel classification and get somewhere. And it's actually not so bad. Right. If you if you have a much bigger data set or if you just want to go faster, right, then having more RAM is what helps. And then also for all the other workflows, which have to read the whole thing in memory, then that's where it really um, starts mattering. 
right? So on the cluster, and once if you have if you have trained the classifier now want to predict the whole thing on the cluster or on a different machine, right? So if you just have an even bigger server that uh, where you just only have headless access, I, I think running Elastic Headless is fairly easy. So you know, I know people who are very not, let's say, deeply computational, right? So plenty of biologists here manage this just fine. And uh, for the MTI stuff, we actually have an example there, but mm -hmm. we can also, I mean, we, we will provide more examples like procedure and so on, but because every cluster configuration is actually a bit different, it's hard to just provide a script where we could tell you, you can just run this, right? So this script for us is the elastic minus minus headless itself, right? And that can just run one elastic on there and parallelize that. But um, if you want to submit many elastics and then have it coordinated where they write and uh, you know what, what regions they read, I, yeah, then you have to submit 10 drops. But I think it's just a drop that calls one command. So I think it's fairly easy. OK. Uh, and the documentation is on the Elastic website, right? Yeah, at least yeah it's, it's all on the part. Elastic website. There also is like a whole big subpart about headless processing. OK, OK, good. Um, related to that, uh, how do you, can you, if you want to prepare data like in the a, uh, N5 format for Elastic, mm -hmm. how would you do that? And would you uh, prefer to use N5 or H5? I think it really depends for, you know, how big it is. Okay. Uh, so after a certain size, you can't really even manage an H5 anymore. I, you know, no one likes to have 500 gigabyte single files. So I think up to, let's say, 100 gigs, you can probably still go with H5, but yeah, or let's say up to 10, yeah, up to 50. After a certain point, yeah, it's, it stops getting efficient. So I don't actually have any examples for N5 um, conversion, but I hope that uh, the N5 authors would actually have some on their own website. I can look it up and put it for you in the Excel. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it, It's so, not difficult. Okay. So, so we will uh, look for the answer and we will uh, add this to the uh, embedded.sc thread that we make for this webinar. Yeah. So, and uh, I have another question related to time lapses. Uh, how does Elastic handle the, the time lapses? And do you need to split the, the, the time points when you're doing the segmentation? Or? No, actually, time lapses are the best, right? Because in time lapses, we never compute features across time. Right, so it's always within the same time frame, and that means that it can be fully parallelized across time. Right, so if you want to do a full prediction on time lapse data, it would just and the the individual volumes are actually small enough, it will just uh, parallelize by time itself. Right, if you are tracking, also there are parts in tracking that require segmentation or object classification. It will also do it for every time step individually. So time lapse data for us, it's like the easiest to parallelize on. Okay, mm -hmm. it's good to know. Yeah. I just saw in the chat related to the N5 question that uh, someone posted the uh, oh, yeah. tool for copying between N5 and HDF5. So, but we will put this back also in the, the thread of mm -hmm. questions. So, I don't see any other question for Elastic. So, um, Marion, just yes. one question about the overall format because we are already. Um, yeah, so I mean, we still have a full half an hour for Janiv, so yeah. that he doesn't get disadvantage here because Matthias and I took too long. So I don't know if there are general questions that you would like to ask all of us. We don't have much time for those, but maybe we could still do one or two at the very end. But overall, I think, yeah, Janiv, take as much as you need. You know, it's like, yeah, our fault, but we, you know, we kept the margin for you. Good. Yeah, yes. if you, if you have yeah, for, for all the attendants, exactly as you said, Anna, if you have more general questions, mm -hmm. uh, you can still uh, ask them and we will uh, complete at the end. Anna has to leave, but Dominique is staying for the elastic part. So, um, so thank you, Anna, for your presentation and the questions. It was really great. Uh, I will give the floor to Jean-Yves now. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um... Hopla. My name is Jean-Yves Tinez. I work in a small facility in the Institut Pasteur dedicated to uh, image analysis. And uh, I will in, try to uh, speak a little bit about tracking uh, when we do 
uh, in the context of, sorry, of, of large images. And I will try to convince you that we, we have it relatively easy compared to what Matthias and Anna uh, do. What I'm going to show you actually uh, has been done by or with Tobias Peach and Vladimir Ullman. I think they are here today. So if we have uh, complicated questions, they can be here to answer. Roughly speaking, the outline is the following, right? I'm going to introduce Mammoth and Mastodon. A disclaimer, that's your projects uh, we, we, we did. Uh, I won't be speaking much about you know, other, other frameworks. And uh, mainly, I will try to introduce you to the fact that Mammoth is not enough and explain to you why the reason. And I will also speak a little bit about practical aspect. And basically, I'm simply going to repeat what Anna did <laughs> say to you just now. So rough, roughly, Historically, uh, we were interested in tracking because we were trying simply to actually plot lineages in C elegance embryo. And C elegance embryo are not large images. And for that, we made a plugin called TrackMate. That's something that's tightly coupled to Fiji and that was good enough. But this is not large images at all, right? And so it was based on actually opening the image in Fiji, which means that you know, not only the each time point, each 3D stacks of one time point was in memory, but also all the time points were in memory. And so of course, this does not scale at all. This is not suitable for large images and TrackMate is not a good plugin for, for these questions. If we speak a little bit about you know, data organization, uh, we can say that you know, the, 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 this Nubia's workshop is about you know, big data analysis. And if I take this, uh, oops, sorry. If I take this, uh, let's say, words of wisdom from uh, Kota, actually, uh, he defined in a famous paper and numerous discussions in the Nubias context, when, you know, what is an analysis workflow? It's basically, you combine several components into something that gives you uh, analysis, like scientific results on which you can draw scientific conclusions. In the case of tracking, it's fairly easy. You, you, the first component is what allows you to open and manipulate an image. You have the tracking components that take this image and actually outputs tracks. And then finally, you have, you know, the tracks are never the answer into a tracking pipeline. You want to measure speed, you know, where they go and so on, then you need to do analysis, for instance, in R, MATLAB, or Python. Interestingly, actually, if you look at the, the size of the data items at each of these steps, you could say like, you know, the image are typically large, they take a, large, a lot of space on, on, on the disk. The tracks don't take a lot of space, it can be medium to small, and the analysis phase are, are small. You, know, you always go to a certain data compression. The question that we have now, you know, that would be using TrackMate as a tracking component, is what do you do when you have very large image? And in that case, uh, what I tell you is this, you know, TrackMate breaks, and the reason why it breaks is because of this. We don't have a good component to manipulate large image, and that's what we see. And so, at the time, like I'm speaking of a fairly old plugin now, I think the work started in 2015 or, or 14, and uh, when uh, I met these people, Anastasios Pavlopoulos and Karsten Wolf, who are there here today, they were interested actually in big embryos and uh, measuring them over a long period of time over these fantastic machines, the light sheet fluorescence microscopes. And what you see here is actually the reconstruction from you know, the seven or nine terabytes data set, I think. Of course, you know, there was no way we could, we could track anything like that. Fortunately for us, you know, Tobias Speech and the lab of Pavel Tomanchak created the big data viewer and together we created Mammoth. I'm going to introduce you very briefly about that. It's based on our two interests on actually being able to harness and analyze large images, either the context of developmental biology or in my case, uh, infectious biology. It's, it's, it's super simple, right? The, the, um, Tobias actually uh, created at the time a beautiful file format and visualization engine called the Big Data Viewer. Matthias introduced it to you. If you attended last week's seminar, it was the focus of last week's seminar. And two weeks ago, Tobias presented it. In Java, it's really, the, it's been the, the, the core at the center of so many interesting developments. And Mammoth, you know, it simply says, hey, we take the big data viewer as the image component and we combine it with TrackMate as the annotation engine, the tracking engine. And it worked, actually. Uh, now Mammoth, it's, it's, uh, it's a finished project. Well, it's still maintained, huh? don't worry, but it's a sense that you can subscribe to it. And it, it, it tries to all these goals. And uh, the Anastasios, Pavel, and Karsten, they were able to, to, to actually 
use it as you know a third party users to to do science it looks like this if you know trackmate you will find like incredible resemblance with trackmate but it's really a user interface that helps you manage like you know, getting your bearings in large data with several windows in a lineage tree right which is what what it was about and uh, uh, sometimes people miss that but i think one of the, the key interests of the the big data viewer is that it's something that can you know, manipulate 5d data you know time z channel x y but also actually several views of the data and it was made for actually the the, the spin and so you can have a, a combine several views of the sample and you know this is what was useful for for the movie you just saw but you could perfectly imagine use it for instance correlative microscopies or combining different modalities with that it's built in you have it and it's for free because it's done already anyway scientifically the mammoth uh, project was successful this is you know the work of tassos and Carsten, uh, published in this paper from 2018 on which they were able to actually use it to produce some work and uncover you know the source and origins of lineages of progenitor cells and you know how they formed these beautiful digitations that we see on the shrimp uh, that will uh, that in which this embryo will develop if you want mammoth uh, you like everything you've seen you just have to check the box mammoth in the fiji update of now it's documented and ready to use the problem was the the the, the following so if i take again my, my small graph you know with the pipeline the notion of condensation is this now we have something that can actually harness very large data. So that's that's something great. And uh, Mammoth as a tracking component is still able to um, actually track this very large data. The problem is that on this uh, schematics, you see here, I put the tracks as you know, medium to small in size. And you know, sometimes it's uh, not correct. <laughs> Because the, the, we thought that initially only people wanted you know, to manually track a couple of lineages, but not the full embryo. And unfortunately, somehow, it, you know, ex existing techniques were, were out that were able to actually process these huge embryos, as well as the use of cluster or computer clusters in biology. And so um, after that, we meet, for instance, you know, Katie McDowell that you know, told us this, like, you know, I would like to track one billion cells because I have this in my mouse embryo that I would like to throw it over a long time. And this is reported in a paper that you see here. And you Fernando Ahmad actually pro proposed, uh, and the colleagues, uh, this is the work of you know, one of the three, Stefan, Stefan Preibich and Salfeld and colleagues proposing you know, techniques that can actually track and detect cells in such a large data. And so it turns out that actually the, the TrackMate engine was not made for that at all. It could, because it was actually developed on small images, it only could harness a small number of tracks. You see what I mean? Small images, but reasonable images just re generated a reasonable amount of tracks. And suddenly what we needed was, you know, we have gigantic image that generating a gigantic number of tracks and, you know, mammoth nor track mate could harness them. And so this is why we have to literally to start again from scratch. Like this is the moment, you know, with, um, Tobias pat me on the shoulder and says, you know, we probably have to start from scratch. And, you know, this is Mastodon. And so far, this is our best effort into actually proposing something that can track a large amount of data. So Mastodon actually just reached beta, uh, I think the, the from uh, the I2K conference and his uh, user interface looks like this. Again, you will recognize some of, you know, uh, features that resemble what you find in TrackMate, such as, you know, the wizard based um, detection, uh, sorry, detection steps and tracking, the lineages like in track scheme, but also what's super important for us is that everything is interactive. So you can still manipulate millions and millions of tracks, but you're know, still keeping the ability to actually interact with the data. Blows to it, edit, manually move a cell, one million and so on. And uh, yeah, it's, it's in beta, it's free to use actually. I don't, I really don't have the time to, to make any kind of demo right now, but, but uh, maybe I can show you if we, if we have the time. So roughly speaking, what amounted in Mastodon was we had to rewrite everything, but we still uh, use the big data viewer as, a, as an image component, which makes like you know, everything needed with big data viewer will work. But we have to restart from scratch when it comes to the track data model, the writing efficient structures. 
And so here's a quick benchmark actually just to, to, to show you the amount of this space it takes to actually store a certain lineages. And you see that I realize the alignment is not good. Never mind. Realize that you know in the Mastodon versus Mammoth, the, the, the data structure is uh, I can say so well done because you know that's mainly Tobias ID. It's so well done that you know it takes much less time to actually create it, but also much less memory space. Right? Up to the point where Mammoth wouldn't be able to display in such a lineage, while Mastodon has no problem with that. So you achieve something which is 30 times smaller in memory, 30 times faster uh, in processing time. And now the, 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 the one of the cool things is that it's easy and you, we don't need any kind of complicated or let's say elaborated hardware. Everything is done you know, on the 2012 MacBook Pro. Alors, the, the, the plenty of cool stuff in Mastodon and I will not, not pass that, that actually required a lot of, of work and sometimes excruciating. It's really made for you know, end users with, without complications. The one thing now I would like to, to uh, to explain to you in the last part, you know, is you know, how to go forward using actually sensible data organization. Okay, as we move you know, from uh, small or reasonable images to large images, we generate a large number of tracks and of data. And in the end, you notice know, data somehow as either to be created or manually notated by several people or by many people. So how do you work with that? How do you um, actually share the load of having several scientists working on that? And now what I will detail you know, is some of the, the, the practical, the tools that work in practice to do that, first starting with the data organization. So with just the image data management, uh, we can say that you know, the most classical way of handling your data when it comes to tracking is having everything on your uh, computer. So you would have the, the, the BDV files, and uh, actually it's made of three files, the HDF file that store the pixels, uh, XML files actually is the master file, contains you know, the, the, the position in space and the metadata. And then you have the settings.xml files that just contain the display settings. And then finally, you have a master file that actually points to the image and contains the tracks, right? And so you have the image data and the track data are separated, that's very convenient, but they're all together. And now the, the fact is that you know this guy can be like several terabytes, and so it's not it's not an, a good idea to have it on the on your laptop or on your computer. You want to have it in a centralized space where it's backed up. So a classical approach that I've seen several times, you know, is having justice, right? You separate a little bit the storage and you use a classical approach in lab is to have a network drive. Um, I mean, I think it's until recently it's relatively common to have that. Uh, it's not a fantastic approach. Why not having something like this? Uh, the desirable, I would say, data management would be the following, is that you would have the very big, the very large files, the ones storing the pixel on a server. And actually, as an image data on your laptop, you would just have actually the master file. And so it turns out that, you know, again, Hang on Ki Moon in the Tobias speech again, actually, they created that a while ago, the big data server. And it's something that will run on you know, a remote machine, actually just serve you know, the sub volumes Anna told you about. I'm sure you have seen that before. So that in your master file, instead of having a pass to a file, you see if you have that HTTP then an address. And so in the metadata of this talk, um, if you see, if you look at you know, the, the the Google Doc Marion shared with you, you will see that you, know, you can download, you can download a Mastodon file that contains that. Alors, I will uh, share my other screen if that's okay with you. If I found the control to do so. Right, I hope you see my screen. Please say yes, <laughs> give me a live yes. sign. Right, so this is the Mastodon uh, user interface. So if you, if you follow the instruction, download the file, this is what you have. And what you see here, actually it's the tribu uh, Tribolium, again taken for the cell tracking challenge. I think it's a 400 gigabyte data set, but 
this data set is not on my hard drive at all. It's something that actually is self, I'm uh, uh, sorry, I'm home <laughs> in, the, in the Paris region. And you know, this data that you see is on a past uh, machine somewhere that is exposed. So if you download this file, you will access that. And you see, it's really doing a good job. What, what's key for me is that everything is interactive so that I can inspect the data. I can zoom on it, rotate it, and explore it. Because you know, we are microscopists, so we need to interact with the data. As I move in time, you see that you know, there's the pyramidal resolution that zoom in and that actually loads the data remotely. But nothing compromises the, the interactivity. And so it's a very good solution. And actually, the Mammoth simply plugs that over that without any issues. So what you see, the Mammoth, uh, Mastodon, sorry. What you see here is actually the result of uh, the fully automatic tracking of this, of this data set on, on, uh, done locally on my computer at home, right? And uh, I can make some coloring by uh, spot intensity, for instance, so that you see with me the, up, how the cell division happen, right? And it didn't take that much time to get that. Nine minutes, actually. The fully automated detection only took nine minutes. And so I have this on my computer. The full Mastodon file is maybe 14 megabytes, I think. I have all the tracks data here with me, you know, with the analysis intensities and so on. Uh, I can even use the, the coloring to inspect it. And the lineages. Artisans, these are not two lineages because I didn't detect the, the cell divisions. But you know, all of this you can browse, right? And this is kind of the, of a, it's, it's a desirable, uh, let's say, data organization. You have the heavy data that's you know, remotely on the server in Pasteur, while I can do all the processing locally with little overhead computationally and still have all the data locally. And everything is very interactive, right? It's not something that runs through a browser and so on. That's really, uh, I don't know how you Zooms work for you. That's something that's very responsive that I can uh, track and so on. And so I can delete stuff and undo and everything, right? Okay. And so that's an experiment actually we wanted to carry and say, okay, let's say if we have that, we have one copy of the data stored somewhere in Pasteur how many people can work on it simultaneously? And so this is why we tried in the uh, I2K, the last conference tutorial. So we had like two times four hours at very odd hours, I would say, of the day, um, sessions where we would uh, taught the people how to use softwares. And so one of the things I say, say, look, there's 12 people each time. Let's try all of us to actually connect to this a you know, simple server that would serve big data and see if we can crash it. And we failed to crash it. Also, and at this, I have to believe people because they were uh, coming from very different regions of the world, but uh, all people say, yes, it's still actually uh, interactive and you can still browse it. So this is something realistic. The only thing I had to give them, you know, is these three files, the Mastodon file pointing to the XML file, the XML files pointing to the server. And this is what you will find with the, the, the materials attached to these sessions. Right, so this is more or less the, 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 the summary, right? This is what you've seen from my screen. And that's uh, what you see here is the, the, is the raw data, okay? What would be the next step? The next step actually with this, if you think about it, is that every time I have the image data remotely, and I have the local machine with my local tracks. But sometimes, you know, some embryos can be so large that, you know, you want to be, have several people actually creating it, simply inspecting or actually manually annotating. And so you would like to have the same way collaborative annotating, annotations, and being able to share actually the, 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 the data together. And so that's not my work at all here. I, I'm actually <laughs> getting the glory for the work of Vladim, Vlado, Vladimir Uzman, who, who's supposed to be here today. And so he wrote a, a Mastodon extension that just does that, right? That actually you have an image server, the big data server that we've just seen, but he actually put together a lineage server where actually people would track locally and then push upwards to a lineage server that would you know, make sure you can 
merge all the lineages coming from several people into one. And so Vlado actually made plenty of things, you know, such as something that tracked over time, how many spots are added manually and who did that and so on. And it's working beautifully. Uh, this is you know, something we have right now in Pavel's lab, Pavel Tomancha's lab, with actually clever strategies is that, you know, when you want to merge actually several lineages, it's a good idea to ask people to track different parts of the embryo to avoid conflicts, but there's your know, conflict resolution, right? So roughly, this is what, what I wanted to say in, in practice when it comes to tracking. My first conclusion is that we have it easy when it comes to tracking. Like images and tracks, they're well separated. And actually, even the automatic detection of cells doesn't require a lot of new image processing or image access. We can exploit the, the pyramid, uh, pyramidal decomposition and be very efficient both in memory and in time. And when we have the tracks, well, we don't need the image anymore. So, you know, so that's very convenient and very, uh, very efficient. Uh, our main challenge there is that when you move to huge images, you generate huge amount of tracks. And this actually prompted us you know, to trash these two guys. Trackmate and Mammoth are not good enough are all for very large images, simply because large images generate large amount of tracks. So you need something specialized again, not only at the image data, but also at the track data. And this is our answer, our best answer is, is Mastodon. And finally, I wanted to attract your attention you know, to, to, to the existing solutions for, for reasonable image you know, sharing and storage, this kind of big data server. That there are other solutions, but this one is, is really great. And we're looking at, you know, for the N5 file format actually stored on the server via Amazon, for instance, or you know, what the OME consortium will generate. And with this, I have to thank these awesome people I worked with and that actually helped me a lot, uh, more than anything, you know, some did the work, <laughs> particularly Vladimir Ullman and Tobias Pitch. And also on past side, uh, Dimitri and True actually that helped me actually set up the whole big data server stuff. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention and you and here are the links uh, if you want if you're interested in actually testing Mastodon and there's even the manual. And thank you for your attention. Thank you a lot, Joy. That that was a, a really great talk uh, about tracking in uh, in big data. I have a first question for you. Um, in TrackMet, you have the possibility to have the automatic detection of spots. Is there something similar in Mastodon? Yes, in Mastodon, you have both fully automated, that means you fill the whole data set and it does the detection everywhere, and the semi-automated. And semi-automated is, you know, you click on the cell and it follows it over time. Okay. Um, oh, <laughs> I have a nice uh, question about the future. Will Mastodon replace Mammut and TrackMate? It will replace Mammut. Okay because uh, all functionalities are in Mastodon and there is even more in Mastodon than in Mammut, right? Yes. Okay. Um, track mate, well, sorry. The, 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 track mate because, will stay. Yes, because the, I'm actually writing on, working, sorry, on sometimes focusing just on 2D images, small images, but actually bringing machine learning and deep learning components to that and interoperability with existing software. So this I cannot do in Mastodon, but I can do it in TrackMate. Mm, okay, okay, that's a good point. Um, so the, the examples you showed us in the presentation are based on tracking of nuclei, but do you have other examples of particle tracking? Uh, I guess no, with, uh, with your tools? Uh, oui, alors the, the, can I, can I, is it okay if I reshare my screen with the demo? Yeah. So the, the, the key limitation, and we have this question a lot, is that, you know, the, the what is the, the, sorry. Voilà. The, the tools actually that can automatically detect, uh, let me delay if I delay everything. The The tools that uh, can detect automatically the object in TrackMate, you know, they are very simple so far. And that's all, every, all the tools that are good at detecting what I call blobs. And a blob, you know, it's something that is roundish and bright. And so if you have something like, uh, oops, sorry. 
if you have something that's like you know a cell label for its membrane, something that has a torus shape or a complex shape or or something like this, you know, mastodon will not be good for that. It it really needs to be something that resembles a blob. But as soon as you have that, it's honestly okay. Again, I don't want to show off, but it's reasonably good. Okay. Uh, and is it possible to have the merging of particles? Ah, yes, absolutely. It, it's okay. made for that. There's the we started with, with Tobias by actually porting all the algorithms that we have in TrackMate and more. And so there are you know, the fusion detection and the track splitting detection. I think that you know the like most of the time we have the practical approach and say we you know, inspect everything by hand and correct for the cell division because they're very rare event and very crucial for the detection. But you know, I'm sure that you know, with a, a good scientific project as a as a background, we can develop something some something that are more more sensible. Like you know the. Anna Kreshuk didn't speak so much about it, but she has awesome tracking algorithms in Elastic. And they are very good at that, right? Yeah. And so that's, that's a solution to that. OK. Uh, yeah, we have five minutes to, we are, uh, yeah, we have five minutes to finish. Um, have some more questions about the, uh, how you handle the big data? I mean, uh, basically, do you support GPUs? And also, what um, what would you recommend for uh, for in terms of specification? Uh, mainly RAM when you're processing data uh, with Mastodon, and how when you're doing your benchmarking test, what kind of uh, uh, specification do you use? What kind of computer do you use? Yeah. Why, why I'm listening to you, but I, I'm just tracking your cell division just to, <laughs> just to okay. show. Right. I'm very happy to say that we don't support GPU. You don't need a GPU to work in Mastodon at all. I had, we had this discussion before, and it's very good. The okay. reason is that now you have uh, Mastodon is a software that just requires Java and nothing else. So there's no dependency, no nothing. So it can run on a cluster, it can run offline, it can run on an old computer. Has come to memory, it's made to be interactive on a small laptop, right? This is not a fantastic machine at all. And so I try to run it on a something, a very old PC with four gigabytes. Uh, four gigabytes is a bit not enough, right? Particularly if you want to do automatic stuff. I recommend eight gigabyte laptop. The most important part, if you want to enjoy the interactivity, is use a mouse, right? In all the demos and, and tutorials, we make people use the, the trackpad and insoluble. We, the, the most important, more important than the GPU is a mouse for Mastodon. Okay. Um, yeah. okay. I, I would have a more general question related to. Uh, so, first, uh, interaction. Um, of uh, on data that are uh, stored in a server. So you talked about a uh, big data server. Is it a, um, a technology that could also be applied to LabKit or that could be used uh, by any tools the, using big data viewer? Uh, here, hail to the, the, the previous programmer like Tobias, Matthias, Anki Moon that made this. I think you know, everything big data viewer can work with the big data server, right, Matthias? Yes, yes, you can store your image data on a big data server and use it with FlapKit. Okay, also for great. the segmentation, it has to download the highest resolution level. So okay. it's, it it's, take some time. It, for us, what it means to actually move from a local storage to a, to a big data server is literally one line in the file where you point to the server, you give the IP of the se server, instead of actually to, to, to the file. And it's as simple as that. OK. OK, that's, that's, that's great. I uh, have a second question, which is also for, for uh, Matthias and also Dominic. Uh, John, if you showed the, this possibility to collaborate in Mastodon, the possibility to annotate uh, together a data set, which is really important when you have such large data, and especially when you want to track billions of cells, it's a problem to handle the file, but it's also a problem to curate the data with a, a human. 
Uh, is it possible to do this in LabKit and uh, Elastic, or will it be possible in the future to have this kind of collective annotation? Um, I don't know about Elastic, but uh, I don't have it in LabKit. So, okay. but I know that people nowadays use LabKit to also manual create dense annotations of their images and to later use it for a neural network training. And I think that's something really interesting and I want to improve it, but I need to find time for that. Okay. Um, and for Elastic maybe, uh, you, in principle, you could combine labels from different project files. So if everyone uh, works on the same data, um, then you could probably write something in Python that combines them, but we don't have anything built in. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, so we're reaching the end of this webinar. It's five o'clock. Um, I would like to thank again the three speakers of today. So um, Anna Kreshok, Jean-Yves Tienve, and Matthias Arts uh, for their great talk. Uh, I would like also to thank all the, uh, the participants for uh, staying till the end. Please um, fill the survey uh, that uh, we posted in the chat window. Uh, this is really important for us and for the speakers to understand what uh, uh, went well and what did not went well and uh, go well and what are your expectations uh, for these webinars. So thank you to all of you and uh, see you for uh, the next webinar, the next uh, webinar on big data next week. Thank you. Bye people. Thank you.